Hi, my name is Steve Schnee, the CD Junkie, and I'm normally the host of Beach Blanket Fort Bingo Video Podcast. But right now, I'm honored to be here on Cherry Red TV's YouTube channel to have a chat with Immaculate Fools lead singer and songwriter Kevin Weatherill. Cherry Red Records is releasing Searching for Sparks, the albums 1985 to 1996, a seven CD box set containing the first six studio albums with bonus tracks, plus a seventh CD that includes previously unreleased live recordings. This is a release that should be an everybody's want list. And now I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Kevin Weatherill. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me. Hello, sir. Every story has a beginning. So yeah. how did Immaculate Fools come together? Essentially, it was a, a, a set of two brothers. Well, actually, it started kind of before that. The story starts before that. Um, I was a bass player until I was the age of 30. Um, I was a late developer in all this this game. But I've been playing as a bass player and I'm earning a living, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I thought, uh, I'm not really, I had a few close shaves with getting deals with bands and stuff. And I thought, I think I'll give this up and just write songs mm. and become a songwriter uh, uh, because that's what I enjoyed the, you know, the most at the time. And I, I'll become a songwriter and, um, and make a living that way, write songs for other people. That was my initial plan. So um, I, was, I had a friend of uh, Martin Ansel, a friend of mine, and uh, he's a musician and a great singer and everything. And he said, well, let's let's demo some of your songs. And I said, OK. So um, we, we, uh, we we started to demo the songs. And I said, hang on a minute, who's going to sing the songs? Because I'm not really a singer, you know. I'm a mm -hmm. backing singer, but I'm not a singer. Yeah. And he said, no, you sing them. You'll be fine. And this guy's a fantastic singer. I was a bit intimidated because he's, he's really good. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so anyway, he encouraged me to, to sing the songs and I did. And then we sort of formed a little bit of a band and started playing concerts for fun, you know, little mm -hmm. gigs. And, uh, and, it, and it started to go really well. And I found that, that I had this, this voice that people liked, you know, and, uh, and I enjoyed singing very much. I remember the first concert I ever did where I was the lead singer. I thought, hey, this is great. Mm -hmm. I love this. I'm enjoying this more, more than uh, as a bass player. So anyway, um, we, we had a few different lineups and things like that. Martin had his own career thing going on. Mm -hmm. And um, and my brother said, knew I was forming a band. I was living in London. He was living in Rochester, uh, about 30 miles away, and uh, where we were born. And he, he's, he sort of said, oh, come on, man, let me be the bass player. So I went, OK, so he's the bass player. And then Andy, I, I met in a, in a wine bar in Clapham uh, when I was playing there with Martin. So he became the guitar player and he had a brother who played the drums, which was handy. So we kind of fell together as a mm -hmm. four piece, mm -hmm. as two sets of brothers. It wasn't planned at all. Uh, and it just sort of happened and we played together and it was great. So we just carried on as we were and we became Immaculate Fools. Um, and that's that's how the band was formed. It started from there. Well, you always of a time period was it uh, between the time the band formed and the time that you signed with AM? Ah, uh, good question. Very quickly. Uh, we found that very quickly, we were doing the usual London circuits, you mm -hmm. know, playing all the usual concerts, look, the pubs, the clubs, everything. The usual scene, not even having any major city. And we noticed that there were more record company people and publishers turning up than, than audience, even though the, the audience <laughs> was good, but there was the places were packed, you know, and we were going, there's a lot of record company people. And eventually we we ended up signing to A&M. There's a longer story behind that, but I don't think now if we've got time for that. But uh, but anyway, that's that's it. They, it was starting to get full of record companies and we ended up signing to A&M and it was all very quick. The whole thing from the concept of starting was a, about a year or less, you know, it was like, wow. but, but especially for me, who, who'd never been a singer before. So I've, 
I became a singer, and a year later, I've signed less than a year later, I've signed a co contract with AM Records. Uh, I've signed a publishing contract with Rondo, mm -hmm. and I'm in a big limousine in uh, Los Angeles somewhere going, well, that what that plan just went totally wrong. You know, what, what <laughs> I do it, here? it was all it was all a bit of a shock and that's when it hit me when i was i was touring america and doing promo and stuff that this this plan just went so horribly wrong and and here i am touring and you know <laughs> singing in a band which was fantastic you know. everything, everything is Was there a bidding war or was A&M really always the front I runner? I think there was a, a little bit of something going on because you need that, I think. But uh, yeah. it was all left to the lawyers, really. I didn't, um, we had we had an excellent lawyer and uh, and I just left it all to them and, and the manager. I don't, I try not to, I, I, I have to know what's going on in the business, but from day one, my job is to write songs, play, play concerts, make records and, and the business, I need to know, but it doesn't interest me at all in the business, any yeah. form of business. I'm just not that kind of person. Uh, your 1985 debut album was um, Hearts of Fortune, which featured yeah. uh, one of your best known songs, which is of course, Immaculate Fools. So yeah. the, the big question is, what came first, the song or the band name? Uh, well, originally we were, when we started out, we were called The Bleeding Hearts. And, um, and we decided that this name wasn't right and we were looking around for a name and I just, I already had the song. So I just thought, wow, Immaculate Falls, there's the, there's the title. Immaculate Falls is, is, uh, is a song about the, the human condition. The fact that mm -hmm. we, we, we have this perfect thought, which is, you know, these beautiful bodies and minds, et cetera, et cetera. But we have this other thing going on, which is this lust for power and greed and, and, and violence, et cetera. So it was a kind of, I thought it described the human condition quite well. And funnily enough, I mean, the new album that I'm, I'm just about to release is called Stardust and Water. And that's the same. We are actually made of stardust and water, human beings. So right, conti right. Continuing the theme, there's, there's a, the, the story just goes on and on. Yeah. <laughs> we are enchanted. album introduced your unique sound because it was it was eclectic and unconventional in many ways but it was also very melodic pop oriented yeah. and the album uh, uh sort of weighed between the two you know there was the eclectic original unique side of you and then the production sort of tamed the band sound a little bit was the whole album yeah. produced by colin thurston well it was produced by him but uh, the he was he was uh, fired basically oh. and we went to we had to go to glenn johns to remix it because the record company wasn't happy and, and we weren't happy with it it was it was the beginning of digital world and yeah. everybody was trying out their new boxes and that's what he was doing and he had the drummer in one room and he was hit a snare and that would trigger off some computer somewhere and mm -hmm. and it was like no, no, we, we stay in the same room, you know, like the Rolling Stones and all, all those bands, you know, we, yeah. we want to be in the same room playing together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how, how it started. Uh, we went to uh, Glyn Johns for a couple of, about a week or two weeks or something, I can't remember. And he remixed the whole album. And that was an experience in itself because I get all the stories about the Beatles, the Stones. he just come off tour with Bob Dylan recording an album. So I was in heaven, you know, it was, yeah. it was great. So he, he basically saved, saved the album. After that, uh, Andy, that guitar player, produced uh, the next three albums after that. Never It 
took uh, another two years, and then Dumb Poet came out, uh, your sophomore yeah. album, 1987, yeah. and it received a lot of attention. I remember a lot of people, uh, uh, radio and, and you know, people in the business talking about it. You know, while the songs are just as riveting and eclectic as the debut, it had a cleaner, more focused sound. Was that a yeah. conscious decision, or was that maybe a suggestion from the label? I think the second album, they were bringing in lots of different producers to try to you know, the, the tricky second album, because the first album did quite well, especially in yeah. Europe and places. And uh, we were doing really well and they get nervous. So they kept bringing in all these different producers to work on different songs. Mm -hmm. And um, none of it was really working. So in the end, Andy, our guitar player, I took over the production of it. And uh, and that was his his kind of view of, 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 the, of the band, and um, which we liked. So we we're very happy with that. You know, we went along with that. And like I said, he did the, the next two albums after that as well. Even though he'd left the band, he was still our producer. He was still still Yeah, involved. exactly. We see you can't deny the passion in the performance and lyrics of tragic comedy because, you know, first off, it should have been a worldwide massive hit. Um, That's what the brothers thought because Pete and, uh, and, and Andy wrote that song. Yeah. Um, and, and we were, com they, they more than me, um, basically, I was, I was, I just sang the song, but we, we were kind of, when we heard the finished thing, we were kind of, thought, yeah, this is going to be a big hit. And yeah. it wasn't, it, it wasn't what we thought it was going to be, even though it's still a, a really popular song. Um, I don't, I, I don't play it live myself because I don't know what the chords are. I'm going to get angry. <laughs> <laughs> And we thought it was going to be big. And then shortly after that, uh, Peter left the band as well. Mm -hmm. I think Pete was the first one to leave. That was the kind of tipping point for, for the breakup of the original four, really. Was with Pete. When, when Andy and Peter left, uh, was there a point during that period when you thought, uh, okay, I'm just going to lay it to rest and do something else? Or was that never an option? See, my vision of, of my image of what I do is I'm the, I'm the guy with the guitar on his back, walking off into the horizon to the uh, next concert. You know, that's that's yeah. my gig. That's what it is. That romanticized thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in places, it is like that, you know. And, and a and actually offered me a solo deal. And uh, even before Peter left, I think, because uh, things were changing there. They changed the MD and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they offered me a solo deal. And I said, no, I'm, I'm loyal to the band. And uh, I've always liked to be in a band because my vision of songwriting needs a violin or it needs someone who can really play the guitar. Yeah, right, right. It needs all that. So I can't do it all on my own. It was a turning point and, and, and I, I have never considered giving up altogether. No, that's never been an option. So what I did was I just, we just, we just auditioned drummers. We, we got a, a violinist, uh, Barry w mm -hmm. Wickens, and we just went off and, and see what happened next, you know, and just carried on. I carried on writing. It was never an option. Uh, it's interesting you say that because the band's been going a long time. It had a, it had a, a long period, like 15, 20 years, where there was no Immaculate Falls because I killed mm -hmm. it and went off this dirty mm -hmm. road did my solo thing and different collaborations. But uh, it was never an option to stop. I wish you were here. Here in England, the weather is fine. Here in England, I wish you were here. Here in England, the weather is fine. Here in England, and I wish you were here. Now we're doing this red thing i'm looking back at the original four mm -hmm. and to be honest that was that was the best immaculate falls i mean I, i've had fun and i've had fantastic moments and worked with fantastic musicians but when you go back and you listen to the original four of us and you see us in concert playing there's a there's a 
videos of us playing live in concert. It was magic. It was just magic. It was mm -hmm. fantastic. We're all smiling, we're all happy. There wasn't any of that kind of serious shoegazing stuff. It was, <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't all like that. We were like of the people. We, we hung out with the fans and all that kind of stuff. And we were a proper rock and roll band in every respect. I want to say that. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of fun. And the music just happened. We never really thought too much about it. We worked at our craft and we made it as good as we could. But at the same time, we were having so much fun and we got on so well. It was, uh, it's not until you look back and you go, hey, you know, this is really, really good. And, I, and, I, and it's, it's just how life is. It's, it's, a, it's growing up, isn't it? And going, well, that was then. And you can't have that now. No matter what you do with the Mac, you look forward, you can't have that. It's gone. Yeah. And it's the moment and all that kind of stuff. One man's camp is another man's drink. One man's job is another man's fate. Just another day. Just another day. In a sense, uh, the third album, Another Man's World, seemed like this transition album between the sound of the first two and then the albums that were yet to come. Was it an easier album to make compared to the first two? I think we kind of took it a bit more seriously at that point. Mm -hmm. We were still having all the fun. And we, there was different musicians involved now. But uh, Andy was really, Andy Ross was really on it. You know, he's really honing his craft with that album, mm -hmm. I think. And, uh, and I never listened to it for like 15, 20 years. And I, I went back to it and thought, man, this is, this is something else. This is good. And I, I take your point. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of the stuff that Andy had learned and we'd learned from the first few albums, two albums. And then we got to uh, Another Man's Well. We were kind of riding high. We thought, yeah, we know what we're doing now. We know where we're going. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and it is, it is a, you know, not for me to say, but it's a great album. <laughs> the album you know is it's warm it's earthy and it has more of a folk and blues influence mm. i mean if you go back you know once you're settled into that album uh, another man's world if you go back now and listen to the first two albums those influences are still there but they're sort of below yeah. the surface was another man's world an album that maybe that you had envisioned making at the very beginning or were you just evolving as a songwriter and moving in that direction I think we were just evolving. When I write a song, I never think about the end. I just think about, I'm in the song, I'm writing the song. Mm -hmm. Whatever the song needs, you give the song what it needs and, and it comes out and you go, okay, that's, that's a great recording, that's a great song and move on to the next one. Um, but yeah, I think it was mostly evolving and, and me honing my craft of songwriting and Andy honing his craft of uh, being a producer. So sad, so sad I think the album we have now, uh, the new one, I think people are, are saying, are picking on that album. They're saying, hey, this is, there's a flavor of another man's world going on. You know, you're back on it, you know, after all these years. And uh, so they're, they're, people are very happy with, with what they've heard of it. So. And, and I, I've, since working with Andy again after all these years, I've realized that Immaculate Falls is actually me and Andy. I couldn't make the, the, the new album without him. So, and he, he lives in Australia and I'm living in, in Galicia in Spain. So it's the, the logistics are ridiculous, but I did, man, it took me about two years, but I managed to lure him over to Spain and, <laughs> and we recorded the, the album here in this room. So Immaculate Falls now is, is back properly now. I, I will never record again without Andy Ross as a producer. Mm -hmm. If I'm recording an Immaculate Falls album, there's no point. Toy Shop, 
was released yeah. in 1992. Another fine album that blended those folkier elements, uh, but yeah. it had a, a, a heavier edge than Another yeah. Man's World. But did you enjoy taking the music in this direction? I mean, it was, you know, a heavier rock sound, but yeah. it was also played with a lot of these traditional folk instruments like violin yeah. and stuff. Yeah, we were just enjoying ourselves. And I like the idea of putting uh, like a really heavy, dirty guitar with a mandolin, for instance, and, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. or dulcimer or something and mixing things up. Um, and I still do that. You know, I like that idea. And I was also thinking back to the first couple of... Uh, the vibe of kind of people like Rod Stewart's first album, you know, with the mandolin wind and all those kind of songs and the, yeah. and the, the fun that was in that. But I was also listening to you know, heavy rock as well. I like all kinds of stuff, you know, but I've got a very eclectic taste in music um, and I soak it all up. I, I don't exactly steal from people, but I absorb stuff. Oh yeah. So you, if you, if you listen to, Pretty much all the all the music I've ever done. If you listen closely, you can hear my little homages to people mm -hmm. that I like, or sounds that I like, or just little things like uh, "As the Crow Flies," which Peter Peter and I wrote together. There's a oh 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 oh, uh, which is uh, from um, the Clash, you know. London oh uh, Gordon, yeah, uh, and so it's li just little things like that. I just. I just give these little clues to people as to, to what I'm up to, you know, uh, yeah. what, I'm, what I'm listening to and uh, what I like. So the clues are all there in all the songs all the way through. The living song, the living song, the living song. The living song, the living song, the living song. I like acoustic music as much as as, as electric music, and so mm -hmm. I've mixed the two up. And I'm a big fan of Bob Dylan, Tom Waits, uh, Springsteen, all those kind of songwriters. It's the it's the craft of songwriting and mixing it in with like warm sounding, real instruments. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes everything in the pot. If fans or listeners of the band, if they didn't notice before, it was pretty obvious by this time that Immaculate Fools was a band that dealt in honesty and passion. Uh, yeah. And it came out in the music and lyrics. It was more obvious than ever. Were the sounds that you were creating in the studio close to what you were hearing in your head when you wrote the songs? Yeah, yeah, pretty much so. I was, I, I write everything on acoustic guitar. In fact, mm -hmm. Uh, I've been living here for nearly five years now. Where I'm sitting now is where I write my songs. I have a, a, an acoustic guitar here. I have Netflix on. I have a piece of paper and a pen. And I, I watch films and I, I like to watch foreign films with subtitles. Uh -huh. So I, I, I'm, I can see that they'll translate something from Spanish to English or Italian to mm -hmm. English or mm -hmm. German or whatever. And it will just come out slightly, slightly different. So I'm, I'm playing away and I go, Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I'm writing these ideas down, you know, and I might take that down and move it around a bit, but it sparks off ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is pretty much how I write songs these days. It's just sitting here and waiting for the fish to swim by to catch. <laughs> that the environment affects the way that you write a song so like do you write songs different when you're sitting in a flat in london rather than when you're sitting in a 400 year old house in spain are the things that are inspiring you allowing you to create something different good, good question um yeah I, i've never really thought about that but uh yeah i think so yeah i think i think where where you are and what's happening and what's happening in your daily life and what's happening uh, socially with you um, can affect things. I mean, I'll, I'll pick up, I'll be at a party or something and somebody will say something. They could be drunk and I just sort of say something. And I'll go, ha, 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 ha. You know, <laughs> my antenna is always open wherever I am. Yeah. And I think maybe, maybe yes, but I'm still sitting here five years after leaving uh, Britain. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm, but I'm still involved in British politics. You know, it still infuriates me. You know, yeah. <laughs> on there. And the same with America. I mean, I'm really up on American politics too. Here in Spain, the politics is so complicated. I can show you that when it starts to rain, everything is just the same. I can show you. I can show you. In 1994, Woodhouse came next. Uh, on this album, everything was stripped down to basic elements. Uh, and, and sonically, I felt it really sort of focused more on the melodies uh, and, and the great lyrics. What was your concept for that album as a whole? Well, when we, we made that up, we, by then, we, uh, we bought a, a farmhouse in Shropshire. And we had our own studio. Um, so which was great, but we didn't have a record deal at the time. So mm -hmm. we thought, well, while we're sniffing around trying to get a deal, we'll, we'll record an acoustic album because it will be easy and cheap and, you know, we've got yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. we can take our time. I don't even know how long it took to do it. We just kind of did it in a very casual fashion. Yeah. Um, and that's how that all came about. And it was just, it's, well, it's just guitars, violins and dulcimers. Mm -hmm. The band in the past didn't rely on cover versions, yet there are two featured yeah. on the album uh rain by the beatles of course and ship song by nick cave yeah. what inspired you to tackle those songs um rain song for, uh, for some reason i mean i love the, the the beatles version of it with that bass line which is just, uh -huh. it's the it's the main anchor for the song really is that woo, 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 bass thing yeah there. yeah but the top line is always fantastic and i thought i i was sitting there with an acoustic guitar and i just it came out with this kind of Celtic kind of vibe for the song and I just thought go with that you know and I played that live a lot you know in the okay. in, in the past on mm -hmm. my own or with other musicians and it always goes down really well the people that hear it think it's one of my songs and I just say no it's not mine it's a Beatles song and they go well I've never heard it and, <laughs> and so check it out and yeah because uh, I you know you can I'm not gonna beat I don't see a point in recording a song to be honest, if it's not going to be better, but in this instance, I'm, it was an act of love. I just love the song and I just wanted to do mm -hmm. a version of it. And, and it, it works, you know, it works the way I want to do it. But when I crawl into your arms, everything comes tumbling down. Come sell your ships around me. And with the ship song, I just think the ship song is one of the most beautiful love songs I've ever heard. I just think it's mm -hmm. it's such a well crafted song. And I was just messing around because I don't really do covers, but I was just messing around. I thought oh, this is such a lovely song to sing. So we ended up recording a, a, a version of that. Then you'll be ready for me. The next album was Kiss and Punch. Sonically, it was completely different than uh, Woodhouse. In fact, some of the songs in the album were really straight blues rock. Was that a conscious effort to move away from what you did on Woodhouse? Because this was really sort of a logical extension of what you had done before. Well, uh, the violinist and the guitar player, Brian and, and Barry, they were producing this album. I think mm -hmm. they produced Woodhouse too. But they 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 produced the album. I didn't I didn't I, once we recorded it and put it out. I never listened to it, and I didn't listen to it until years later. And I think there's some really great moments on there. Sound wise, I think once again we were just going with the flow of what was happening at the time, mm -hmm. how we felt mm -hmm. at the time. Um, some of the songs took a long time to to get right. But yeah, I wanted to uh, 
have some kind of blues vibe because I was heading, I was getting a bit lost, Steve, in a way, and I, and I was thinking, well, mate, I, I'm kind of heading back to my roots, and my real roots are, are uh, Howling Wolf and John Lee Hooker and mm -hmm. these guys, you know. When I was 10, that's what I was listening to. That's what I was playing and wanting to be, I wanted to be a black blues man, you know, <laughs> grown up. <laughs> but you're only 10, what do you do? What do you do? My parents were completely flung. It's this 10-year-old kid walking around singing about, my women left me drinking some whiskey. And, you know, it's all, just 10, you know, drink whiskey. Mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on? So it was, but I wanted to go back and use that as a platform. Uh, and so there's some of that influence going on there. And, and I have to say that album was, was hard work, but looking back, there, there's, some, there's some good moments on there. Some, I think there's some good stuff. And, and, and people generally like it. It didn't sell so well. It didn't sell as, as well as the other. As far as I know, it didn't sell as well as the other. After that, that was the time for me to move on. the fact that the band remained consistent throughout the career but always threw curveballs into the mix so you never knew what to expect but you always knew it was going to be good did you approach each album differently uh, as a songwriter no i don't think i did i think i just wanted to, to treat each song uh, uh, as its own thing and that's what i still try and do well, the the seventh disc in the box is a collection of live recording uh, captured during uh, different periods of the band's career. Do you feel that the the Fools worked better live in the studio or do you feel that uh, it was just sort of two different sides of the same coin? I think it's two different sides of the same coin. I mean, if you look at the early stuff with just the four of us, the live stuff, it's mm -hmm. pretty, damn, pretty damn good, Steve. It's not, it's pretty, <laughs> Like I'm, not gonna deny, I'm not going to deny. I'm not going to deny that. Some, sometimes you've, we've actually had people in the old days come up and say you were miming because it sounded so much like the record with yeah. just the four of us, and they're going, "You were miming," and we're going, "No, that's what we sound like live." They didn't quite believe you, but that, that's what we sound like. I think if you're going to play live, you know it's not going to be quite the same as the record, and you do your best interpretation of, of it. Yeah. And, yeah, of course. Hopefully it's gonna it's gonna work and it's gonna please people. It's the melody, the top line. It, I mean, I'm I'm playing concerts here in Spain. Uh, I haven't played since February. I did a couple of concerts in um, in the Basque Country uh -huh. um, as a four piece. With two guys from here, who are Galicians, who are my bass player and drummer, and and we're playing the and, and uh, Harry, who's English but lives lives here, uh -huh. violinist. He's from Croydon. Um, so we did it as a four piece and a place both the concerts were packed and from the moment we started they were singing they, they there's it's the top line they they, they love the songs it's the songs that, that yeah get them. but we we had really good sound both times so it's a big sound for four people yeah, yeah. um and the violinist puts his violin through pedals and stuff so he's kind of acting as the lead guitar player as well mm -hmm. um is also playing vocal harmony parts, solos, all kinds of stuff, and I'm doing my slashing away on the guitar, or whatever. But it was a big sound. But it, the thing is, it's the it, it's the top line all the time. They they love to sing the songs, and and that's that's what I do. It's it's the craft of songwriting, and that's when you know, yeah, yeah, it's, this is good. This is this yeah, is, this is exactly. what we want. You know. We are
I know a fan's opinion is going to differ from the band's. So I have to ask, out of all the albums featured in the set, yeah. uh, what do you consider the best gateway album for a first-time listener? I'd have to go with uh, Another Man's World since, as I said before, it's the link between the early stuff and the later stuff. I think that so you can go backwards and it would still sound familiar or you can go forwards and it would still sound familiar. I think, I think I'd have to agree with you, Steve. I never thought about that, but I'd agree with you. I'd say that would be a gateway, another mm. man's world. Because then, yeah, you can go back and you can go forwards and you're still getting yeah. what's going on. But it's a good introduction because it's such a such a, a, a well-made album. You know, it's, it's almost like, well, how can you not like it? Are you not a music lover? <laughs> it, is, it is a good album. And, I, and, and to be honest, I didn't discover it until 20 years after the album. You know, I, I knew it was good, but it wasn't until I listened 20 years later that I thought, hey, this is okay, this is all right, I didn't do bad. Come on, Jay. Now that Cherry Red's releasing the Searching for Sparks box set, yeah. uh, how was it going back and revisiting these recordings? I mean, did, did did you get to listen to everything? I haven't got I haven't got a copy yet. I haven't got anything yet. I've had some I've had some listened to some bits of it. Firstly, I can't wait to get my box set and uh, sit down and spend the day listening to the whole thing. You know, uh, um, uh, I, I think I'm going to enjoy it because it's the stuff on there I I, have, I haven't even heard yet. And uh, I'm looking forward to it, you know. Where can viewers keep tabs on all things Kevin Weatherill, Dirty Ray, and Immaculate Fools? Is there a website? Uh, there's Facebook Immaculate page? Fools. Yeah, there's there's Immaculate Fools uh, web page, uh, immaculatefools.com. There's the Facebook page, Immaculate Fools Facebook, I guess. Um, uh, and there's, it's, it's going on. Other, oh, we have a, a YouTube channel as well, Immaculate Fools on YouTube, so you can see it all. All the videos and everything is, is going to go up on, on YouTube. I do Facebook to talk to my friends and chat to people. Um, and that's about it, really. I've only got just got Zoom, so this oh. is only like <laughs> three days old talking to you on Zoom. Usually I talk on Messenger to people or something. Yeah. Well, that's the show, folks. Um, I'd like to thank my special guest, Kevin Weatherall, for sharing his immaculate memories with us. Remember to check out the 7-CD Searching for Sparks box set on Cherry Red Records. And by all means, please visit Immaculate Fools and Dirty Ray on Facebook and elsewhere on the internet. Thank you, Kevin. Stay safe, be well, and happy birthday. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> End of transmission. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to stop. Well, no, I don't want to stop recording because then um, uh, you might say something salacious that I can. <laughs> There's no, plenty um... of that. Why, why do you think I was called Dirty Ray for a while? <laughs> <laughs>